But let me tell you something else. The cheapest isn't always the best. Because if you nickel and dime the companies down to the very last penny, then they have no money left over to invest in new technologies and research that bring you new things that are coming out. And so you have to look at the gigantic picture, the big picture. Again, in the past, this is where the government came in. Because in the past, the government would regulate companies as monopolies. The telephone company would come in as a monopoly, and the government would say, you're allowed to charge this rate. We want to see how much money you're investing in research. Even today, in Brazil, the government tells research companies that they have to invest 4% of their revenue in new product design and forward-looking things. This is the government saying to these companies, this is what we feel is best for the people. So you have this mixture of public and private. And if you want to create a new company that is more to the left than capitalism, I suggest you take a look at cooperativism, where the people who own the company are the ones who get the services. And then those people go in and vote as to how much they pay for their services and how much they, they have to hire the people to provide the services. They are, in effect, their own company. But this is still a capitalistic method. It is not communistic. This, or, this organization is not owned by the government. It is owned by the people. And it is capitalistic. So sorry, I'm a capitalist at heart. So uh, control. Um, well. Let me just tell you this, I had a hard time listening to my parents and listening to anything they said to me. I don't really listen to my teachers. So I'm not totally for control, obviously. But um, this, is, this is kind of a complex question. I think when I hear control, I hear more about, oh, let's control the information. And that, I think, most people are against, at least to, the, to some extreme. Um, it's really about how much you trust people to make the right decisions, you know, as a community. I mean, I think we would rather err on the side of giving people the freedom to do things and kind of assume good faith. And what I want to do is actually kind of change the question a little bit because this whole thing about the government decides this and decides that, I mean, you're actually part of this government. So this should be a dialogue. You know, I mean, you, you know, influence you know, who's going to be represent you and how these policies are going to be changed. So the fact that the government is here and they're controlling you and you're down here kind of listening to them, I mean, you should get that out of your heads. You are influence of the government. You are part of that government. And you have to help them shape those policies. And it starts at your age. I mean, before I came here, I actually stopped in Hio and I was at Estudanti Net. I don't know if you guys are probably very familiar with that. And I see a lot of students getting together, and they're trying to influence what their education should be about, where the funding should go to. I mean, that's also your job. I mean, part of the government is part of you. So you will probably believe, I mean, we don't want to have like extreme crime, as Mad Dog saying, you need to have some regulation to some certain point. Um, we try to err as much to like having as least control as possible because we want individuals to be free. but. There are some times when that needs to happen, but you need to look at it. It's not an us against them. These people serve you, and you need to influence them in that way. And I'm sure there will be need, need to be some regulation here and there, but however government acts is really a reflection of you and how you influence them. So when we get to that point, if you feel like there are needs to be some control, I mean, you need to help decide that policy. Thank you very much. Agora nós teremos uma pergunta feita diretamente no microfone. Isto. Por Olá. favor. Uh, devo falar em português, em inglês, uh, tanto faz? Uh, ok. 
é o seguinte, uh, eu vivo em uma cidade muito pequena do interior e vocês falavam agora há pouco uh, que antiga, de antigamente quando usavam um modem de escado, bom, na região onde a gente vive ainda existe conexão de escada e muita gente usa. Uh, ainda existem acessos à internet muito ruins na prestação de serviços e é um serviço mediano ou de boa qualidade, costuma ser muito caro. Eu vou, vou te pedir desculpa, eu vou só aí embaixo porque eu não estou ouvindo daqui de cima. Então eu devo estar fazendo alguma coisa errada. Tradução está funcionando? Tradução oh! para o inglês? Tradução, oh, tradução uh... para o inglês está funcionando, né? Are we okay? Uh... Vamos lá. Uh, em muitas cidades do interior do Brasil, uh, ainda existem serviços de internet discados, serviços de internet uh, de qualidade menor e um, serviços muito caros de acesso à internet. Várias pessoas acreditam que no Brasil a internet deveria ser um direito de todo cidadão brasileiro, independente de faixa etária, de faixa de renda, que toda pessoa deveria ter acesso à internet e ao conhecimento necessário para utilizar a internet. E eu gostaria de saber a opinião dos senhores a respeito disso. E agora não sei se vão traduzir ou não. As I said before, particularly if the government is going to depend on the internet to talk to the people, they have to make sure that the people have access to the internet, all of them. Now let me tell you that in the poorest, one of the poorest favelas in Rio de Janeiro, there was a man who said, I'm going to bring wireless internet to the favela. And people laughed at him. They said, it'll never work. Nobody will be able to pay you for that internet. But he went ahead anyway. And he used free software. And he scavenged radio antennas. And he put together an internet service. And not everybody paid him for it. But there were enough people that could afford to pay him a little bit that he could then supply the service to anybody who wanted it. And he kept building it up. And now he makes a good living every month for himself and several employees bringing wireless internet to the favela. The interesting part is that the wireless internet allowed people inside the favela to have businesses which they could then pay him money from the business to help him keep his business alive. This is capitalism at its best, and it was a capitalistic event. In many countries in Africa, people create their own wireless mesh networks and then come together to hook up to the main internet. They do it on their own. And as long as they obey the rules of radio frequency, radio frequencies and what the government says they can set up their own unlicensed wireless spectrum and provide wireless internet just like any other ISP. Well, I mean, we talked about even at the beginning about basic services, um, whether they're healthcare, education, um, access to funds and so forth. And if you believe that those are necessary for people to have access to, I think you have to include um, access to the internet. I mean, the internet is even, it's really just a vehicle, even for all of these services in the future. And this is really kind of like we talked about the digital divide. If you do not have access, you're going to be left behind. I mean, it's not just you know watching videos or being able to tweet or see your friends on Orchid or Facebook. You know, it, provides a whole realm of communication activity and allowing for services. And like I said, education, I see so many things being transported on that. So if you think these things are fundamental to, you know, making people part of a, 
a society, you know, in a community where they can grow and prosper? I mean, absolutely. And it really comes down to economics, and there are so many examples of how this could be done cheaply. Uh, I've seen things in India where there's even like rural villages, and I think they're trying this out in Mexico, and I believe even Telefonica is looking into this, but where they're trying to actually franchise these out where people can set up, you know, wireless uh, mobile services, and it can, the access can get to people in like villages, and I, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't happen in such a dynamic country like Brazil. I mean, Brazil is going to be in the forefront of a lot of things, and it's, it already is. And for it to prosper, people need to have access to certain basic resources, and I really feel like, you know, this is one of them. Um, you may disagree, but I think this falls in line with all of those other kind of basic human needs. And I think it's fundamental to the growth and prosperity and for the stability of the society in Brazil that people have that, that access to the Internet. I mean, it's without question that that's my answer. Bom, o objetivo do Plano Nacional de Banda Larga é exatamente esse. Quer dizer, o Plano Nacional de Banda Larga ele não se resume ao uso da estrutura estatal para chegar com banda larga nas cidades brasileiras. Ele, ele é um plano que vem desde a política industrial, né, como é que nós vamos fomentar, inclusive, a, as indústrias nacionais ou aquelas que queiram se, se sediar no Brasil, queiram ter seus braços industriais no Brasil, até o plano de serviços. Isso inclui aí as estruturas do Estado brasileiro, inclui as empresas privadas no setor de telecomunicações. Existem uns mais de 5 mil provedores, alguns falam até em 10 mil provedores privados que, exist, que tem aí nas pequenas localidades brasileiras, dando para eles condições, uma banda mais barata para que eles possam agregar esses serviços móveis ter, ter condição de ter uma renda melhor no seu provedor e chegar com serviços de melhor qualidade. Então, o Plano Nacional de Banda Larga ele não, não se resume ao debate Telebrás, mas ele é uma política transversal para o setor aonde nós estaremos chegando com serviços, ora diretamente, ora através das operadoras já uh, tradicionais e, e as chamadas incumbents de telecomunicações no Brasil, ora através dessa grande rede de provedores privados que nós temos hoje, que sequer a grande maioria deles está legalizado, porque ele tem um custo tão grande com a banda, né, que ele inibe a sua própria expansão. Então nós queremos que a banda tenha valores mais baixos, para que a gente possa incentivar esses provedores a fazer parte dessa grande rede de inclusão digital que prevê o Plano Nacional de Banda Larga. Nós caminhamos agora para as últimas duas questões do debate. Eu já as tenho em mãos e eu vou me apoiar no serviço de tradução. A primeira pergunta foi feita pelo Jonas Augusto, de Recife. Numa área onde a liberdade pode ser grande, como imagina a internet, como dar um senso crítico às pessoas? Eu imagino... Essa questão foi um pouco debatida, mas me parece que o Jonas é, gostaria de ouvir um pouquinho mais sobre essa questão. A segunda pergunta é sobre...
Uh, a second question is, do you want to question? Yeah, no, we're in Portuguese. We're in Portuguese. A segunda pergunta é de um, uh, um, um audiência não quis se identificar. Como, a pergunta é, como garantir a privacidade dos usuários, uma vez que informações como telefone, endereço, e-mail, identidade, uh, local de trabalho, são armazenados em bancos de dados possivelmente vulneráveis? Então, questão de privacidade, essa segunda questão. First of all, if we go back to my analogy of the internet being two separate things, the communications pipeline or the media, and then the services, I think that the media itself has to be completely 100% open. So there should be no control through the media of what you do or do not do on the internet. You want to watch pornography? God bless you. Okay? That's up to you on the media. On the services, if it's illegal in your country to provide you the, to provide you the pornography, then that should be punished. But then you, as a society, have to decide whether it's going to be illegal or not. That's where you talk to your government. Now there's a third level, and that is the level of etiquette on the internet. And I know there's a lot of people out there who call each other very bad names and otherwise make people uncomfortable on the internet. I believe that the internet should be a welcoming place. I believe that we should treat each other with respect on the internet. I believe that we should act as human, civilized people on the internet. And therefore, people should want to go onto the internet because they will be treated like a human being and not like some piece of dung. One of my favorite cartoons of all times is a dog sitting in front of a computer terminal with another dog. And the first dog turns to the second one and says, when you're on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. Nobody knows if you're male or female, young or old, homosexual or heterosexual, single or married. We're all equal on the internet. And as Linus Torvald says, just show me the code. That's all I want to see. So I think we need to treat each other as human beings on the internet. And where that person be of a different religion from you, you should respect that religion as they should respect yours. That's the only thing. And this has to be taught from the very earliest age. And it's not the responsibility of your school system to teach this. It's the responsibility of you to teach the people that are younger than you and your children. Don't put this responsibility back on the schools or the government or anybody else. It's you. So uh, there was two questions. The first question um, has to do with uh, kind of your social responsibility on the internet um, because there's all this personal freedom. And the thing is, really what the internet does, I mean, you know, for a lot of people it just amplifies the behavior, right? Because it's a tool for that. So bad people can do even worse things and hide by, behind sock puppets and so forth. And good people can do really amazing things where they can motivate a lot of people to get together. And one thing that's really interesting when you look about at history, the internet really what it's done is it's kind of been made everything a democratic playing field, right? Everybody has the ability to do the same things because everybody has access to the same tools. 
So democracy only works if people have the education and knowledge to go out and you know act accordingly. So I mean, really fundamentally comes to when you're having more people come online, especially in a country like Brazil, where you have a very uneducated population that's you know needs to get more educated. I mean, that's part of the responsibility of everybody. And I think you know it comes into governments, schools, and you as individuals, as Mad Dog is saying that people need to know more about. They need to be smarter in general. They need to be educated, but they also need to know about what's the best social behavior in these things. And so this is kind of a process, but everybody has to take responsibility for this. And I think it's really about knowledge. Now that you have access to all of this, you're going to have to learn as a group to use it more wisely. But what you've seen over the past few years is the development of all these social communities on the internet. So I think I'm very hopeful because everyone seems to be getting together in groups and having a lot of dialogue about these things. So you just have to make sure that you keep that dialogue going, and it's already started. So I'm I'm pretty hopeful about it. But you have to understand that on multiple levels, people need more knowledge and how to use these things more effectively. The second thing I want to go into is the question about privacy. Um, first of all, like for us at Wikipedia and the Wikimedia Foundation, it's not much of an issue because we do not track users whatsoever. I mean, if you use Wikipedia, we pretty much don't know much about you anyway, because it's a service. You know, it's we see it as part of uh, like a national park. It's a public service, it's a treasure for everyone to use. However, other sites obviously do a lot of things. I don't know if you heard Al Gore speak earlier, but there was one thing he said, and he talked about how he's even against how you know different companies will um, have you know, tracking software and try to figure out where your user, track user behavior so they can find different ways to monetize it. When you get into HTML5, uh, there's going to be much more dynamic features in your, in your web experience. However, this also allows for a lot of companies to go after you and find out more information about you and start violating more privacy issues. And I have a lot of deep concerns about that. I remember I was a panel about this and people talked about should that user data belong in telecoms? Should it belong in Google? Or should it belong in Facebook? And I don't know to what extent you trust any of these things. And I think this is the start of a whole new dialogue. I mean, it could possibly be in a separate entity where I talked to a friend that's at um, uh, the information school at UC Berkeley, and he was saying that we should create a repository where everybody's information is controlled by them. In this repository, it's a complete separate entity, and I thought it was an interesting concept. Um, I think this dialogue is going to further develop over the years, and everybody's fighting for that information right now, your privacy, right? And I want you guys to be aware that this dialogue is going to continue, and I want you to be a part of it. But now I have a lot of questions about it. Um, I see this real idea about kind of it being in a different nonprofit entity and people really having control over that, or you could actually, you know, data, private, you know, personal portability of data. You know, like I think Google's kind of been pushing this a little bit. I think that's also pretty important. But I don't trust anybody with all of my data, and I don't think any of you guys do either. And so we have to kind of figure out what exactly that model's gonna look like. I think the telecoms will probably have some of it, but we need to make sure what's being used in what way, and we have ownership over that. And people that use it know that they're responsible to us. So keep that in mind when we start moving to this over the next few years. Eu vou só complementar dois aspectos. Primeiro que a questão do uso ético da internet é, um, é do processo civilizatório. Né? Nós temos que, o nosso crescimento como civilização, como a sociedade, ele está na base da, da, da família, no, na escola, quer dizer, é um processo civilizatório que nos ensina a maneira de agir. Isso independe se nós estamos na internet ou fora dela. Então, nós temos que continuar procurando ser sempre uma civilização uh, cada vez mais ética né, e ter os processos que vão aí uh, inibir ou punir aqueles que não são, independente da tecnologia, da plataforma que a gente está que a gente está trabalhando. E só em relação à última pergunta, eu quero dizer para vocês que a nossa experiência 
que temos uma base muito grande de informações dos cidadãos brasileiros, é que nenhuma fragilidade aconteceu na, na nossa história em nenhum banco de dados. Né? Foi dito que bancos de dados uh, frágeis. Nós não temos nenhuma situação dessas. Problemas que acontecem são problemas que estão ligados à engenharia social, uso indevido, indevido de senhas, derrubada de...